Not two. I love them. <coughs> um, very, I'm going to attempt to be, and I'm just going to say thank you very much to, to Cara and Doug for, for the session, which has been really good for me as well, because in fact everybody has already said everything that I wanted to say. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm looking at community-driven archaeology um, from my own point of view, of a commercial archaeologist, uh, an ex-council archaeologist, um, a member of a community. I come from East Lothian. And I do a lot of work in East Lothian with people. Doug, Cara will um, sort of know some of the stuff that we'll be seeing here. And what I just want to just quickly try and draw out in the next five minutes as we head towards nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make it four. Um, are the three different strands of community-driven archaeology that I perceive. Before I get there, and it's actually quite important, Oh, hey! Is, I, I love using the word paradigm because I have no idea what it means. <laughs> Only that we, as the archaeological community, actually have to re establish who we are and what we do. We've had a lot of, I was going to change the name of Badger to UKIP briefly. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, these volunteers, you know, they, these volunteers, they come over here. <laughs> Into my trench, my trench, with the barely developed skills at photography and survey. <laughs> that's how we see them, isn't it? That, that's how we, we're professionals. Oh, wait, I'll kneel over there, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking for a job after this. One. We are professionals, are we not? Yes, and they are volunteers, they are amateurs. What do they know? about what we do. We trained hard to learn what we did. Didn't we? <laughs> so we have to switch this thought that we are the ones that know what we are doing. And this bunch of barely developed gibbons that we call the amateur archaeologist are, have no value to us when they have massive value. So leave your attitude at the door, please. We also are human beings, yeah? We are, well... <laughs> we all have different skills, don't we? We all have different abilities. I'm able to come up here, um, dance about, and tell you a, a narrative, a story. I can make up jokes as much as I want. I, I'm remembering something you said to me, in fact, it was last year, the, the last conference, that I am a storyteller. That's what an archaeologist is supposed to be a storyteller but we don't all have that skill i have worked with people who and when we were actually doing community archaeology the therapeutic troweling session <coughs> the troweling away it's all going lovely and then somebody brings up something deeply disturbing deeply traumatic to them i'm not a therapist i'm not ready to deal with that i'm not <coughs> trained for that so a community archaeologist is actually going to deal with a whole range of different skills that we, as the digging archaeologist, or the surveying, how do you do? surveying archaeologist, <laughs> I, I, I've not been trained to do. So there is a need for the specialism of the community archaeologist who has to be able to deal with a much wider issue than just the archaeology itself. That does also not mean who it, I was going to it will be interactive and I'll, I'll tell you how many people put their hands up. How many people think that community archaeology is not as good as professional archaeology? <laughs> <laughs> they lie! <laughs> <laughs> There's no need for it to be any less professional than professional archaeology. Especially if we, as the professional archaeologists, go in as professionals to support them. There's no need to leave that, that, that bizarre concept. That is something unusual the other day. I uh, was doing a, um, it's actually quite embarrassing, I turned up an entire week early to a, a community dig. <laughs> <laughs> very embarrassing for me, very embarrassing for me. Um, 
But I actually found that I charged for my time full price, which I won't tell you how much it was, but it is well above the uh, CIFA minimum. <laughs> and I wasn't embarrassed for the first time. How many times have I, it's voluntary, come on. You don't really get sort of, um, sort of volunteer doctors, do you? Well, you do, I suppose, yes, but. <laughs> we have to actually make a living. We have to make money. We shouldn't be ashamed of going into community archaeology and getting paid a decent wage for it. The results will be the same. Anyway, you lot are going to have to change your attitude, but it looks like you already have. So we'll move on to my three strands of public archaeology. Public research. The example I'm going to use here is up in uh, North East Scotland, Aberdeenshire. It's a, a group, the North East Scotland Archaeology Research Group. Fabulous group, community group, made out of, sort of teachers, ex-surveyors, uh, um, different uh, diverse community in a very rural location. <laughs> and it is community, this is definite community driven archaeology. They are the ones that went out to have a look at uh, an area around a place called Tarland, where forestry had just come down. <coughs> they went across it, there was a hut circle. This is one of my big bugbears, and, and again, something that the, the public can actually go out and do. They're the ones that are wandering around um, while we are tapping away furiously um, with our mitts on the, um, the databases going, there's a hut circle there, but I've never actually been up that hill to have a look at it. They went up the hill to have a look at the hut circle, and it wasn't. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it was excavated by uh, Richard Bradley and Amanda Clark, and it turned out to be... Um, along with themselves, it turned out to be a recumbent stone circle with a Bronze Age cairn filling it. So, foolishly, they then got me in as well to support them, and uh, <coughs> Bruce Mann, the council archaeologist up in Aberdeenshire, provided the money to pay me to go up to Aberdeenshire to survey this other hut circle, which they were now desperate was another recumbent stone circle. Sadly, it being me, it turned out to be a hut circle. <laughs> <laughs> but they're the ones that take ownership of it. And again, that's a word that keeps on coming back. They have ownership of the site. They're the ones that discovered the site. They're the ones that are excavating the site. They're the ones that are actually wrote up the Discovery and Excavation Scotland um, uh, report. They're the ones that are helping me write the report. They're the ones that took the photographs. They're the ones that surveyed it. I, as a professional, am supporting them. The council supported them with money and uh, Amanda and Richard are providing that academic background. Oh my God, is that council, academics and professionals all working together along with the community? Yes, it can be done. That is public research. That is community-driven archaeological research of the highest standard. It's also, <gasps> time for, shameless plug, <laughs> the Archaeology Skills Passport, available at all good um, archaeology skills passport sites. We have, or I have a whole uh, box of them in my car downstairs. We also have public training. It's a two-way process as well. You can utilize the resource of archaeology. This is an 18th century pineapple house or pinery vinery. Is it vinery pinery or pinery vinery? Pinery vinery. Pinery vinery. <laughs> And it's an amazing site to use to train up uh, students, because remember, they are our future. <laughs> it's an educational resource for kids. And in fact, I'm now actually working um, to produce uh, an educational pack for the local schools that's looking at the, uh, th this one blew me away. The pineapples of the 18th century. There is a prize, there's a free pint to anyone who can tell me, apart from you, how much a pineapple cost in uh, 1796 in Scotland. And you. Just because you've shaved your beard off, don't think I don't know who you are. <laughs> 4,000 pounds for a pineapple. A rich man's sport. How much a pineapple costs now in Aldi? 90 pence. Inequality in the 18th century is actually matched with inequality. You're never going to eat another pineapple after this. Inequality in the 21st century, because you know why it costs 90 pence for a pineapple? Because we are exploiting the people of Costa Rica 
and destroying their landscape and making them a monoculture so that we can have our one pound pineapples. Well, in the 18th century, we had to dig up vast amounts of coal to produce the pineapple. I'm, I'm off on a pineapple rant just now, so I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> it takes you off in all different ways. I have been learning and I've been trained by gardeners. Uh, I'm talking to architects, I'm talking to all these people who are training me backwards and forwards. This is archaeological training as a two-way process. <coughs> it also allows me to uh, take a site which cannot be damaged even by students. and use that to train them in the skills that they will require to follow a career in archaeology. And then this is the one that's my all-time favourite. I'm now copywriting this term. It's transformative public archaeology. <laughs> what it is, uh, you take a site, you find a lovely council archaeologist, you find a lovely site right next to it, I can't remember who had the site in the, the school. That was um, bingo. Bingo. <laughs> exactly. And what we had here was um, a 16th century townhouse in Haddington, in East, uh, East Lothian, where I come from. We just dug a hole right next to the, um, the road, right next to a bus stop. We'd done it before next to a bridge at, at a place called, um, what the hell was it called? Nungate. This is just archaeology for the community. So you just open up. How many people have walked past? I've always wanted to be an archaeologist. And you just give them a trowel and you get them into this site to let them actually get involved in their archaeology. We were fortunate because I knew what I was going to find down there. And it was an entire um, 16th century uh, townhouse, which will go back. But it just allowed people to get involved in it, to stop and get involved. Why am I calling it transformative? Because it didn't matter who or what you were, you could get involved. Carl will remember some of the fabulous stuff at Nungate where um, we had um, names have been changed to protect them. Uh, an incredibly drunk posh person <coughs> talking to this incredibly drunk, not very posh person. I don't know what the proper term for that is. Um, and it, it was amazing. They were talking. <coughs> <laughs> but they had one thing in common, they had the site in common, they were able to discuss it. And I know that health and, health and safety will not um, love me for this one, but I had um, heroin addicts at uh, Bothwell help emptying the buckets for the Young, Ar young Archaeologist Club. <laughs> <laughs> and the Young Archaeologist Club, oh, I can't even lift it. Oh, 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 I need more lash mark. <laughs> <laughs> but the kids were sort of going, come on, you can do it, just lift another bucket for me. All right, all right. <laughs> and there you had groups and communities talking to each other, <laughs> getting horribly true, yes. You, <laughs> you had um, people who would walk past each other in the streets, talking to each other. You had young kids with um, the pink ladies um, who, are, who were sort of... Uh, Women who were incredibly nervous and so you didn't jump up behind them and make loud noises. <laughs> <laughs> but they were working with the kids. Five minutes, that, no worries, five minutes. Um, I feel like we've gone on now. <coughs> you were transforming the society because you were actually bringing it together, utilizing archaeology just as that, that focus. Because suddenly you had all these people going, that's really interesting, that's a brick. And you're going, well, that's not a brick, that's a stone. And then these discussions would happen. And then somebody would come along and go, I've got a painting of Bothwell Castle before it was knocked down. I didn't know about this, can we get a photograph? Oh, I didn't know you would find this important. It is important, it's now in the HER. Um, you're bringing it together and at the back of it, you've got professional archeologists actually making sure that the job is done right. Mm -hmm. I love Photoscan, actually saw Photoscan, because it meant I could see a photograph of a site bit by bit as it was like, ah, oh, where's that soil going? And rebuild that site, um, fortunately, digitally, when it was going horribly wrong in places. <coughs> so you would never know from my report. But the archaeology was done well. The research was done really well. And in fact, I had all these people who couldn't get down on their knees, but they could go to the library and research who lived in these places, what they did. I found some incredibly emotional stories attached to this place. I even had an 84-year-old coming in saying that she lived in the place before it was knocked down. 
superb. You're transforming the society using archaeology. Then you can be, of course, innovative. Inhibi <laughs> that word. <laughs> innovative. Close enough. <laughs> I can't say that or parallelogram either. <laughs> and it is all the stuff that, in fact, Pete, I was so glad. You'll be, you'll be amazed to know that I, uh, I, I'm a dear friend of Peter as well. Um, so much you can do rather than just the dull DSR, data structure report, blah, 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 yeah, context number. You, has anyone ever heard a poem involving silty sand? No, but you can have um, poems of how you react to a hill fort. Big bloody green hill was one of the poems from a six-year-old. <laughs> don't know where they got that from. You don't, as, you, as someone else said, you don't have to just dig. The survey that you can do, um, GPS locations of um, what we're doing, hut circles, measuring hut circles. You're actually learning skills like maths and, and other stuff and, and uh, what's two minutes off? <laughs> There are so many other things you could do. Uh, other ones we're doing is, for example, Minecraft. We're building the Antonine Wall with Minecraft. <laughs> a song, a poem, a self-published book. I was taking kids around um, who are not, they were educationally challenged, but they were still able to go around Haddington Town with me, and do all these photographs and come up with all these stories and produce a book. These kids produced the books. How proud are they? A book which is now uh, on sale, at, well it's not on sale, it's on view at uh, the gallery, the museum there. People can go in. They are now uh, feeling valued. There's stories, there's plays, there are operas. There are so many other things you can do. And it, to get involved in this, uh, you were talking about, uh, uh, Paul, about going to the air show. I did an excavation next to, and this was a, fool, a foolish mistake, next to a 5k run. <laughs> <laughs> and there's all these people going, what are you doing? <laughs> and you're able to then tell them about Heatherwick. Heatherwick actually comes from Heather. Um, it was a, 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 probably an Anglian farm, blah, blah, blah. By the way, if you head down there, there's actually still one of the last remaining um, uh, Heather Moorlands next to a coast in Scotland. We're digging an 1800s house here. By which time they go, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> but they would come back, uh, or they would bring their kids, or they would just, in fact, a couple of them just stayed and sod the 5K run, we just stayed and do some archaeology. <laughs> We're doing other innovative things as well, um, soil samples with uh, farmers. This is actually led by the artists. Artists at, uh, in Dunbar, Northlight, uh, Her um, Northlight Art, as opposed to Northlight Heritage. And the artists are going around all the farmers in East Lothian collecting soil samples from them. But that's now going to be linked into the archaeologists, who will then also look at the soil from that point of view as well. We're looking at it from all these different points of view. So, the key factor is, there's nothing wrong with being a fully funded professional community archaeologist. In fact, at the back of it, why shouldn't I say the word that no one's ever said yet? Chartered. There's a good idea for a chartered archaeologist is the one that can actually help support a project. You need to be specialised in this. All the skills that you need to be a community archaeologist. We are, we, and I, I see this from everyone that's been saying, it's like we have to be specialised in this. And you also have to have clearly defined goals, not just for yourself, but the community has to have a goal of what it wants out of it. You also have to be prepared for alternative views and outcomes from these projects. There is nothing wrong with, and I, I stand by it, interpreting the hill forts of East Lothian by dance. <laughs> <laughs> We also have to have a two-way engagement. Listen to what people are saying. Don't do this top-down, I'm the professional, I'll tell you how to dig. Listen to what other people say. It doesn't have to be right, but you've at least entered into a dialogue and a discussion. And also consider that the opportunities are there to produce the next generation. And that is one of the most important challenges we have. And I think what much of what this conference is about is skills and training. And it's quite clear um, from the Manchester students' talk that, although the, the figures look good, we are uh, not giving 
the archaeologists uh, the, the skills that they need. And I promise not to do this joke, but I, I can't help myself. It's kind of like <coughs> the last days of the Reich. Um, where is this going? No. <laughs> I am going to. I'm going to do a spoof version of Downfall. <laughs> oh, these figures for the the HRF will never take them. Um, the last days where we're now actually at the point where we're almost actually pushing people out. The sort of, I was going to say the Hitler Youth, but rather the, I'm not creating Hitler Youth with archaeological students. But we're pushing them out with a trowel in their hand, you know, most of the trenches are going. <laughs> <laughs> we have an opportunity to give them the opportunities to get the skills, to get the training, because there's very, very few places that can be done where you're actually gaining all these amazing skills that we have, and they are transformative skills as well and transferable. So, on that bombshell that archaeology students are nothing like the Hitler Youth. <laughs> Thank you very much.